Welcome back to Race Industry Week 2023. We have a few more sessions before the end of the day, and Paul Feiner is back with us. We are going to be talking Formula G, and as I mentioned uh, uh, before that, then we'll go to Las Vegas to talk about the F1 Las Vegas Grand Prix. Then we'll have Brad Sweet, uh, we'll have a crew chief and NHRA panel, and Dave Darland. So we've got a busy schedule ahead of us. You know, Francis, this every single day has just been strong. That The type of leaders and superstars that we've brought on, and we're so grateful to them. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's just that's the whole goal of this week. And uh, we've got Paul with us to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I think. Yes, indeed. So we're going to ask uh, Paul to start his video. And uh, and as soon as the video is working, we will dive into this. So ah, looks like there's a little uh, technical issue with yes. uh, with. Okay, so we're going to um, stay with us. We're going to bring our technical um, uh, genius and IT team uh, that's going to work. Thank God um, for IT people. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that's what happened. Lord knows I'm yeah. not one. Yeah, me either. So, so what? While we wait, uh, Paul, to get Paul uh, uh, on with us, any any thoughts on on the previous uh, sessions today and the previous days, and uh, you know. Uh, first off, uh, the, the the most I think meaningful thought I have is that where else do you get to see all these people come together in a conversation that you can go back and rewatch too? This is literally the Congress of Motorsport globally, where the entire world comes together for the benefit of the sport to share what their year has been like, what they're planning to do, and what's new. I uh, it's really evolved into something uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud of. Uh, thanks to both of you and what you've done and your commitment to make it happen. You are always so magical with your words, Paul. <laughs> You're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm an art director. <laughs> <laughs> was also the world's worst magazine editor when I attempted that. But thank you, Judy. No, seriously, it, uh, just being part of the ideation for this and, and the development of this since the beginning, um, you know, I, I made a comment talking to Tony Perella the other day that I had observed that he learned faster than the competition. He had this compressed time frame in which he had to learn his business and evolve. And what you've done is very much that. You've learned and evolved your very new business uh, in, in a very new format quickly. And uh, I think that the industry now knows what he portrayed is that as a result of this. And uh, you know, I know you started out to change the world, and I think this week is evidence uh, that you really have begun to do that. Well, thank thank you. you. We are market makers, and we do our best. You, sure I mean, you yeah, it's just you know, we did it with trade shows and trade publications for twenty years, and today we do it through a platform, an online platform, and the creation of content. But the the job is the same. The tools have changed. As simple as that. And uh, talking about tools, uh, we have a little technical uh, challenge with Paul, and our IT team is uh, uh, working uh, uh, with with Paul. We should, you know, get this fixed. And that that's what happened when you're live. Uh, oh, and yeah. uh, so. So we can we can hear Paul, uh, but we can't see him. So we're just going to do, wait uh, to make sure everything works out, and then we'll bring him on. Uh, any anything you want to say, uh, Paul Farner, about uh, Formula G because it's it's going to be interesting. It's uh, the, oh, I think Paul no still a little challenge. So we're going to uh, you know wait to get this sorted out. But do you want to say a few words, maybe, Paul? Yeah, just before we begin, first, I've, I've known Paul for um, 15 years. We we were well acquainted. We had the privilege of working together on another project. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Paul and his intelligence and his tenacity. Um, and uh, I will tell you, he understands the media business probably better than I do, uh, given his background. But uh, his excitement for this particular project got us excited, and we were very honored at Racer to be uh, the media platform that broke the news about the renaming and rebranding of Formula G. Paul will tell you a little bit about that when he comes on. 
But uh, our history uh, as a company is we've embraced progressive technologies and racing series. We believe that racing has got to learn faster than the competition and evolve with changing times. And uh, so having the ability to announce this uh, uh, and uh, Dominic Wilde, our correspondent based in the UK, broke these stories and uh, worked with the team at Formula G to uh, reveal uh, their plans. And we're probably going to learn more today when Paul comes on. But, uh, you know, make no mistake, uh, this is uh, the shape of the future. And some of the things Paul is going to talk about today, uh, I believe, are the right things that need to be done uh, to expand the audience and participant base for progressive forms of motorsport that have new technologies and, and new formats. No, I mean absolutely, and and that's uh, and I'm I'm hearing, uh, you know, our, I, I know our team is trying to reach out to Paul to resolve this little technical challenge, and if not, we're going to bring Paul without uh, without the the video, um, but we're just trying to make sure, you know, we can we, we can produce a, a, a show of great value for you and uh, and here so he comes. I think he had to change computers. There he oh, is. There, there we go. There we Thank go. Thank you, Paul. Hey, good. I really apologize for that. I just wanted to make a big appearance. <laughs> well, it, you certainly built the suspense, Paul, before you came on. Great to see you. <laughs> and I could hear you building me up. So thank you, Paul. That's all right. Don't let everybody down now. Uh, so uh, first off, great to see you. And, and uh, again, thank you to uh, uh, the team at Formula G for uh, allowing Racer to break the news of the name change and, and work with you and rolling this forward. We're enthusiastic supporters are what you're doing. And I think that uh, that we'd I'd just like to start with uh, you providing some background to how you became involved in Formula G, what your racing background, because I don't think people may realize uh, uh, that are not deep into the world of racing where, where you came from and what you, uh, what you were doing related to motorsport here uh, until recently. And now you're at the front line of it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Paul. Yes. Yeah, so I was uh, very fortunate to uh, uh, meet up uh, with Jay Penske back in 2003. And uh, I worked for him on the media side of the business of what is now Penske Media Corporation. I was EVP and uh, ran most of the uh, mergers, acquisitions and operations for uh, 14, 15 years. As a part of that, I got involved with Steve Lusso and uh, and Jay when they did the first attempt at the Indy 500, as you may remember, when we yes, had uh, Ryan Briscoe driving. Um, and that led through to, um, you know, us going till 2014 in IndyCar, going up to a two-car team at one point and then back down to, uh, uh, down to one. And then we were there at the embryonic stage of Formula E and uh, we picked up our shop and uh, moved it from Marina del Rey in California uh, all the way to lovely Donington in, in England, which was only 20 miles from my hometown of Coventry. Um, and we were based out of there. And I stayed with, um, that was Dragon Racing. It's now, that team has uh, you know gone through iterations. It's now it's DS Penske. Um, and I was with Jay till 2018 with that team. Yes, and you got to see the evolution, uh, the rapid evolution of Formula E and its its growing appeal and, and influence around the world firsthand. And got to know the management and the uh, and the leadership at Formula E. Um, yes, yeah, we got to work very closely with with Alejandro and and Ali and and Alberto, the the, the core team at the start. And you know, when we got involved, it was a PowerPoint. Alejandro was walking around, um, you know, signing up teams. So it was very interesting. It was very exciting to us because being a digital media company, it made all the sense in the world to do that on the sporting side. And, you know, Jay is certainly a visionary across all aspects. And the way that he uh, put us into Formulary and, and how we just drove that forward, it was uh, it was very exciting. Indeed, it was, and and I, I got to see uh, your team race uh, on several occasions in Formula E, and uh, you know it, it's uh, I view it as our home team in Formula E, right. uh, and uh, you know I, I also have a close friend uh, Robert York who's working with the team now. Yeah, of course, and, yeah, he yeah. worked with us when we were IndyCar as well. That's right, that's right. And by the way, I want to go back to that debut at IndyCar at the Indy Five Hundred. That was a spectacular debut. You were you were a competitive team from the onset. Uh, 
it was it was it was fascinating that that we could get in and be, and be so quick. We did have the advantage, of course, of having um, you know access to some Penske equipment uh, that didn't hurt. Uh, no. But at the end of the day, Ryan did an incredible job, and you know it was a wet race as well as you know. Sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, to finish fifth was was you know amazing in our in our debut race. Yes, indeed. And and uh, I think that sets a tone for high expectations across the board, I think, for anything you're involved with. And I've seen you succeed at, a, you know, an amazing level of success in the things you've touched. I have great respect for you and, and your tenacity. Thank you. Um, and I think that, to me, with you being involved with this, uh, that's what had me at hello. I knew if you were committed to it and you had the energy and excitement about it, that uh, this was a well-reasoned and, and uh uh, a thoughtful approach to filling a need in the motorsport space. So, you know, I've tried to set you up here to roll out what Formula G <laughs> is, <laughs> and uh, and you. why you think it's time for Formula G, rather. No, it's it, it, it's great, and I've been talking to Dillbag about this for uh, ever since he he came up with the concept a couple of years ago while he was still with Mahindra. Um, it's it doing exactly what you said. It's filling a hole in the sport. We're not trying to compete with anybody. We're not trying to be um, a series that runs against major motorsports events. Um, we're there to be a support series and to bring um, affordable, accessible, um, green racing to any type of motorsports event. It can be an ice powered or it can be electric or it can be hydrogen, it can be alternative fuel. We're here to support and the way that we're doing it is is very different to how anyone else has done it because we're breaking it off regionally. Yes. So there's go, there, there's there's an America series, there's a Latin America series, there's a European series, and then there's a GC, GCC slash India series. Um, as you know, Dilbag Gill, who's the CEO and founder or co-founder along with Nick Heidfield, um, is Indian. Um, and so his drive behind this was about creating affordable and accessible racing. And we feel that by breaking it off into being four regional championships, um, you're making that affordability already be scalable because you're not talking about international travel necessarily. I mean, within Europe, yes, but not within America and not within Latin America. You're, you're staying regional um and and so from the driver aspect of being able to enter a series that's affordable through to promoters that are looking for space looking for content looking to have a green aspect come to their race um, event or weekend we're there to plug in it's a plug and play series from the start to the finish we have all the equipment we uh, effectively lease it to the teams, so they have no of the maintenance, R&D, upkeep of the vehicles. That all is our, our responsibility. We hand deliver it to the track. The team take it over. They run their races, and then they pack it up, and then we take it away. Well, that sounds like about the easiest way to get into a, uh, a professional racing series that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Um, uh, and I, I, first off, with heavy hitters uh, like Dale Bag and Nick involved in this, along with yourself, uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is well thought through, great experience on all sides. Um, what was the tipping point to get you all to commit? What was the moment when you said, yes, we're going to do this? So I can't speak for Dillbag and, and, and Nick because they'd been in this for a, for a while longer, but, but for myself, when I realized that everybody talks about inclusion and equality and accessibility in motorsports, and it's very hard to follow through on it. And Dillbag had put so much thought into this. And, you know, in some ways it was experience from our early days at Formula E, all of us is yeah. we went in at a fixed cost series. Um, there were certain elements of delivering a turnkey package um, but then it turned into something different. And the idea, once I realized that we were going to lock this in, there was going to be the franchise element, because to me, that was very important. 
you know, being involved in a team in IndyCar. And I know that uh, uh, Mark Miles spoke about this earlier in the week of, you know, the IP involved in, in equity and, and ownership in a team is becoming more and more important and more and more relevant just because of what's happened in Formula One and the way they're getting valued as teams now. So once I knew that we were absolutely going to be able to offer franchises at very affordable prices, that was my that was where I made the leap in. Right, and this business model, uh, in my mind, is what really got my attention uh, because the uh, it's complex, uh, very risky, and uh, um, it, it's a puzzle most people aren't willing to figure out, as it turns out to start or to join a major professional racing series. This is a very simple, straightforward entry point. Uh, who does this appeal to in your mind? Who is the team partner customer for this? Uh, what what level of motorsport do you think uh, this would uh, you know, compete with, number one, if, it, if there is a direct competitor? Um, and, and who is the ideal uh, team partner uh, if, if there was a mythical being out there. Right, right. <laughs> that, that, that unicorn out there. And, uh, and we need 40 of them, right? Because yes, there's 10 sure franchises do. per region, which will make us the largest, from a team basis, motorsports uh, series in the world uh, with 160 drivers. I think that's there's two parts to answer to that, Paul. Um, the one thing I didn't mention is the dual power race car. Yes. So not only do you have two cars per team, um, so that's 20 cars on track per race. There, the car races at two different power levels, one being FG2 and one being FG1. And FG2 is an emerge is for emerging drivers, um, and it's a development series to FG1. And FG1 is hopefully not competing with anybody, but is a feeder series to the Formula E's, the Formula Ones, the Indy cars of this world. Right. Um, so there are two team elements. One is we are going to be working at the university level um, globally um, to have to, to get that access to talent, which is not just drivers, it's engineers, it's mechanics, it's whatever is happening in the university level. And so look at FG2 as an equivalent of F2 in, in that yeah. you're bringing people in, the budgets are about the same. There's franchises involved. Um, and then there's the professional racing drivers that or the ones that, that come through and flow through to FG1. And that is our pinnacle. But we're right. still a support series primarily. In emerging countries, we might not be. We might do our own races, and most likely we will, particularly in the Middle East, where there's not so many established open wheel races. Right. But a team is a professional team that's either in one of those um, you know, one of those disciplines I mentioned, it could be anything from an F3 uh, through to an IndyCar, through to a Formula One, uh, a F Formula E team. Um, it, it really is someone that's committed to long term. That's why we're doing franchises um, and wants to develop the future talent. Well, that's terrific. And, and the idea that you have a, a, a tiered platform, a, a car that could run at the two different levels is intriguing in and of itself, but the fact, again, you have a reliable platform too. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to ask you, how many cars are you going to have in in service, by the way? How, what's the total number of cars? It's pretty significant. So there's going to be um, 25 for uh, Europe um, that then will switch across to uh, GCC in India. Um, and then there's going to be 25 here in the Americas that will do North America and then go down to Latin America. Uh, so you're talking 50 out the gate when we go racing in uh, very late 24, um, but, but really full season in 25. And then eventually each of those regions will have their own cars. So it will be 100 cars being maintained um, and transported around the world. That's that's ambitious and impressive at the, at the same time. Uh, and when I when I think about this, uh, you know, I, I it occurs to me that we already have seen, you know, teams like Andretti and Ganassi embrace these progressive forms of racing. Uh, with Ganassi, they have an extreme E team. Andretti uh, is obviously involved in Formula E. Um, 
uh, you mentioned IndyCar teams. Uh, we've got basically a lot of racing teams in, in North America and, and down into Latin America. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you recruit or how does a team uh, work in developing uh, an entry with you and a, uh, and a uh, uh, alignment with you? What 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 is the process? So it, it's really just started. Uh, the one thing that I, I thought was really important is not trying to uh, uh, run before we could walk. So we wanted right. to make sure we got the core elements in place, um, meaning we actually have ordered the chassis, we, we have the battery supplier, uh, we have the powertrain suppliers, all of that being in place and ready to go. Um, we've there were discussions that had taken place over the last six months. We've got eight MOUs from professional teams um, from professional series. Um, but as we're approaching this now from a regional basis, where originally it wasn't that case, right? Yeah, those discussions are going to change. So, so the simple answer is, Paul, is contact us. Uh, we have people in the paddocks who are having conversations with teams. Um, again, you know, the one thing I want to be, you know, uh, very clear on is we're not going to try to compete with anybody. We're there to bring value, bring extra racing and bring a stepping stone, an additional new type of stepping stone into professional motorsports. So the conversations we've been having with, uh, you know, the principles of series and teams has been really, honestly, uh, very, very comfortable and very easy to have. But I think that part of this is is that uh, you, you do have people that are known and uh, experienced involved in this, which helps. But more, more importantly, you don't you don't have to go build a racetrack everywhere you go. Uh, you yeah, know. that that is absolutely what 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 you know. I believe the support series really does for us. We're clearly bringing an asset and a value to an entertainment weekend end and adding to a ticket price. We're also hopefully bringing in a younger demographic of, of uh, fan uh, just by starting in that development of having the FG2 and the FG1. We are also doing sim racing. We are in process of working with one of the, the most um, influential people in, in gaming uh, uh, who came from EA Games and created some of the most um, uh, impressive and well-performed games in, in the world to this day. Um, so we want to create this complete path through. Um, yeah, so it's not building those tracks is absolutely key. I have, you know, absolute utmost respect for uh, what Alejandro and the Formula E team and Liberty have done. It's incredible to go into a city center and do what they do. You know, that's that's not our forte. That wouldn't make our, us affordable for a promoter, for a team, for a driver or for fans. So, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And what Roger Penske and you know, Penske Entertainment are doing on the IndyCar side is also incredible as to how they're expanding that and doing more road courses. So we want to be on those same tracks. We want to be there and provide 30 minutes, 35 minutes of entertainment per, uh, per race and, uh, you know, have a space in the corner that they give us. We'll come racing. We'll give you the content. And hopefully teams see those drivers and it's a, a pass through for them going to, uh, you know, a, a professional um, uh, career in motorsports. Again, uh, that's smart. And again, fills another need there. The thing, though, I noticed here, let's say in, in North America, we have some very crowded race weekends and summits. This is not all. Yeah. Um, uh, so do you think this is a, a series that will be best suited to temporary circuit or to a the kind of the really amazing permanent circuits we have in North America? I think it's a combination of both, Paul. I, th I, I think that the way that we design it, the, the infrastructure, the way things are delivered, um, the way that we're doing the charging, et cetera, um, we can plug in. We're not necessarily, if we can't fit in on a Sunday necessarily uh, or a Saturday, maybe we can fit in on a Friday. We have the flexibility the way we're going to be doing broadcasting, the way we're going to be digital focused and platform agnostic means we're not necessarily tied to TV scheduling as well. So we really are trying to make ourselves as flexible as possible so we can fit in 
and 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 squeeze in between sometimes those you know uh, very crowded weekends or be extended on on uh, weekends that have more space got it and i think the 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 digital forward stance aligns with your uh uh focus on younger audiences of course um and i have to ask you too is is uh uh, the development of the uh, the driver identities and, and uh, I think team narrative is going to be controlled centrally, or is that going to be up to the teams to do that through independent ER research? So that's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and there isn't a single answer there. Um, our idea is that we want drivers and all team members, be it their engineer, be it a mechanic, be it the, uh, the, 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 the PR person, to become influencers for that for themselves and for the teams, and then ultimately for us, because we're not reliant on TV revenue. Um, the way our model works is, as long as we have the set of teams and we have the races, the series is automatically profitable. Right. So it's more about how do we engage and build a huge audience audience globally. Um, so we want drivers to become influencers. We don't want to control that narrative. You know, uh, authenticity is absolutely key. And we need them, in order to have all, true authenticity, you have to allow them to do whatever they're going to do. And, you know, I, I, I hearken back to um, when Will Power, when, when IndyCar did this with, with Will Power, and he did that particular sign on the, on the track when something happened yeah. and from then they realized that driver people follow drivers and yeah. and we all knew that and of course the the industry is built around that but it's he became a personality so we want everybody to be a personality you know you don't it's not necessarily the driver it could be the guy that changes the tire he might be the funniest guy on the planet so yeah. let him be an influencer and, yeah. and that's why we won't do any platform um, exclusivity. It's we want people to be able to view this wherever they want. And so if a fan sees something, they can click a link and they can watch the race on Facebook Live, on Instagram, on YouTube, on, you know, whatever it is. We want it to we want this just to reach people that, you know, are will follow those influences. Well, I want to see this on Twitch, but I, I think that uh... <laughs> I think this is uh, really exciting. I'm, uh, you know, so grateful that uh, we had a chance to break the story. And I think it's going to be one of the very interesting stories to follow in 2024 as this comes forward. Uh, I wish you and your colleagues uh, only success in this. Uh, I think that you're going to help everyone understand uh, maybe a, a new and uh, progressive business model as well for for motorsport. Thank you, Paul. We, we, it's a pleasure being on here and it was, it was wonderful breaking the story with you. And, you know, thank you for, for giving me the time to uh, uh, tell the story a little bit. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm sorry I was late to the party. That's all right. But that's okay. We, we, we got the technical issue resolved, Paul. So thank you for being with us. Parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then, enter your company name. Please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.